today. Walking into the room where your friend was shot and seeing an empty desk. 
that's where they would have said, could you imagine continuing to look up and noticing that you have a new teacher because they were shot too? Could you imagine going to practice the same day and your coach not being there because he sacrificed his life to save everyone else around him 300 rounds fired in four minutes. You can't buy alcohol until you're 21. But you can buy an AR-15 as early as 18. One drink won't kill a person, but one gunshot will. Gun control.
So I woke up this morning with another day of boys killing boys, boys killing girls, men killing men, men killing women, men killing boys and girls. And I cried. I cried because I felt the terror in a child's, a father's, a brother's eyes. I cried because I felt the horror, the absolute impossible devastation as a mother's heart sinks to unimagined depths. I cried when I thought of each conscious woman who has to contain or bury her fear 
that she might be next. Whether it's a block in Cleveland or a California street, whether it's an Afghan village or a Nigerian home or an Oregon college, a Connecticut elementary school, a gay nightclub, or a Florida high school, hearts are breaking. Lives are destroyed. Something is wrong. Something is wrong that we are the only species on the planet that so frequently murders its own. Why can't the love we feel prevent this? Why can't the moral codes of all the world's religions prevent this? Why can't all our preaching about peace and understanding prevent this? The thing is, this isn't exactly a human species problem. All humans aren't out there killing their own. Over 90% of these daily killings are committed by men and boys. Over 90% of physical and sexual assaults are committed by men and boys. Not women, not girls. Yes, they kill and maim too, but not at these epidemic proportions. Overwhelmingly, violence is a man problem. So is there something in our DNA? Are human males destined to create this havoc, this ongoing tragedy? That's not likely. But then what's the story? Well, there are theories about bullying or the existence of too many guns, family problems, isolation, poverty, and so on. Each of these may contribute in some way to the senseless slaughter, but none of them can account for the comprehensive violence that accompanies boys' and men's lives. They are simply other symptoms of the cause. The cause appears to be something much more fundamental. Over the last 4,000 years, most cultures on the planet have developed what researcher and author Rianne Eisler calls a dominator philosophy rather than a partnership one. The original dominator cultures all followed a pattern that included the development of strict ruling hierarchies, rigid gender roles, establishing women as inferior, wide differences in wealth, and spirituality that celebrated domination, the demeaning of the feminine divine, control of other species, and disregard for the health of our earth. These cultures were convinced the world was a dangerous, fearful place. They tended toward violence, authoritarianism, with all freedom subject to those with the power to physically coerce or harm others. Unfortunately, our own society is a direct descendant of these cultures. From the moment a boy is born, he is being groomed through a thousand daily messages innocently passed on about what a boy, what a man is supposed to be. These messages create pressure for boys to perform in certain ways that identify them as deserving members of this male group. Boys that don't fit are ostracized. We are taught to funnel our natural energy and occasional exuberance into focused aggression, such as war games, football, the armed forces, etc. While this epidemic of men's violence affects almost every society, our culture exemplifies the problem. We celebrate violence 24 hours a day through television, movies, video games, and much of our music. It is not an accident that over the last 50 years the United States has averaged the most murders per capita of any industrialized country. It is not a coincidence that our yearly defense budget is larger than at least the next 20 nations' budgets combined. We are a nation that almost worships justified or so-called redemptive violence, celebrates warriors, and uses the language of violence to describe almost any competition. We are by far the most militarized democracy on the planet. This mentality drives the man as warrior persona that permeates boys' training, cautioning them at almost all costs to not act like a girl, to not act like a sissy. 
This dominator ethic fuels our distorted attitudes toward women, ourselves, and the planet, causing everything from battering to global deforestation. It is difficult to change this. It will continue to be a mighty struggle. As part of that, we must face that our definition of manhood must radically change. We need manhoods for the new millennium, ones that allow us to celebrate ourselves as unique individuals, not defined by our genitals, but by our hearts. Ones that make us allies to women, children, other species, and the earth. If we fully face the hard reality of the sick, hurtful manhood we have been born into, then together we can create healthy ones in balance with our Mother Earth. Men have done it. We are doing it across the generations, one heart at a time. Hey, buddy, I bet it's your turn. Reach out, reach in. You won't be sorry. Fifteen-year-old Charles Gidnick is in the process of creating art. Maybe like pink or something. I feel like this might look cool. His technique is to splatter paint onto a board. Underneath all the color, take a close look. Rifles. Basically, it just gives it this look of like the gun just like kind of disappearing. Charles is known as a gun artist. I'll keep all my guns over here. He uses toy guns, attaches them to a board, and uses lots of color. Charles calls it art with a message. So it kind of makes the gun like melt into the canvas, which is like my me saying that like violence in the world should like disappear. He says he's not trying to get rid of guns. Charles just wishes he could get rid of gun violence. He says that's what his art represents. I started selling on the Venice boardwalk when I was like nine years old and people would walk by and be like, that's not art. Then I would explain my message to them and their whole mood towards my art would completely change. Six years after his first piece was sold on the Venice boardwalk, Charles has been busy selling his art worldwide. I have small pieces like this one, and these ones go for like 500 to 1,000, and then I have medium-sized ones like this that go for 2,500, from like 3,000 to 4,500, depending on the size. You're 15! Yeah, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> Charles is currently in New York for an exhibit that will showcase his art. What is it that you want viewers to get from your story? Well, basically what I would want is just like to get people talking about gun violence. And now, with the Liberation News Update, here are the longest running and slowest running news team in modern history, River and Tom. Uh, no, Melania, no, no, I haven't seen him. Uh, no, have you have you tried Bill Cosby's place? Oh, oh, I, I, I gotta go, Melania, gotta go. Bye, bye. Welcome to the news. All the news that's fit to eat. First up in the news, this just in. Donald Trump's personal lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen, has announced that he will take a third mortgage out on his house to pay $130,000 to Melania Trump to admit that she's had sex with his boss. The National Enquirer is reporting that Cohen is working with Hillary Clinton and her boy toy, Vlad Putin, to undermine Mr. Trump's Nobel Peace Prize by claiming that he asked both of them to pee on him. As most of us know, Resident Trump's recent nominee for Veterans Affairs Director, Dr. Jackson, withdrew under pressure after he was criticized for having inadequate experience to run the second largest department in the government, serving millions of veterans, and being labeled as Dr. Candyman by White House staffers 
for all the op opioids that he's passed out to them. The candy man can. The candy man can because he fixes it. Word is Mr. Trump also considered Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederate general responsible for the slaughter of African-American prisoners of war and the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Because, Mr. Trump says, I've heard some good things about the work he does. And there's good people on both sides. Having been told that Mr. Forrest is dead, the resident is now said to have selected Kanye West because they both have that dragon energy. In the meantime, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un is slated for an appearance on Dancing with the Stars as Tanya Harding's partner in his own bid for the Nobel Prize. It's now been reported that Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg has a serious nose problem. It keeps growing every time he speaks out about protecting our privacy. Dr. Geppetto says uh, he's working on making corrections. In a bid for world peace, the Iranian government has offered to stop supplying arms to Yemeni rebels and Syrian army if Bibi Netanyahu gives him one of Israel's 100 nuclear warheads and stops killing unarmed Palestinian demonstrators. And now, back to the march for our lives. I am here because I want change. I am here because I am fed up with thoughts and prayers. I am here because just last month, 15 students my age were gunned down in their classrooms along with two staff members. I am here because I call BS. It's time to march for our lives. It's time to change our country's conversation about gun violence. Together we will make a difference, and together we will make history as the generation to finally get some change. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? First, I want to thank you so much for all of the support that you have given and continue to give to the Parkland Coral Springs community. Thank you also for inviting me to speak at such an important event. Our eldest child is a freshman at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. He's a survivor of the MSD mass shooting that occurred on February 14, 2018. He was in the 1200 building on the third floor when the 19-year-old gunman entered and sprayed bullets with an AR-15 rifle, which is the same style rifle that has been used in recent U.S. mass shootings in Aurora, Colorado, Newtown, Connecticut, Santa Monica, and San Bernardino, California, and Orlando, Florida. The gunman took 17 innocent lives, injured numerous students, and terrorized an entire community that day. Our son Jason is a 15-year-old child who must live with the memories of hearing a building full of gunshots, cries, and screams. He is a 15-year-old child who had to listen to the suffering of an injured fellow student outside of his classroom and the silence that followed. He is a 15-year-old child who must live with the memories of smelling gunshot powder and blood and of seeing some of those who did not survive as he was escorted out of the building. He is a 15-year-old child who has friends who watch their fellow students get shot right before their eyes. He is a 15-year-old child who, after the shooting, helped a mother who was desperately looking for her son who did not need him. He is a 15-year-old child who had to attend his very first funeral of his 14-year-old friend. He is a 15-year-old child who has changed forever. He is a 15-year-old child whose life will never be the same. He is a 15-year-old child who survived a mass shooting at his school. I am the mother of a 15-year-old child who spent 45 excruciatingly painful minutes not knowing if he was dead or alive or injured. I am the mother of a 15-year-old child who I could not get to in the aftermath due to the chaos that ensued. 
I am the mother of a 15-year-old child who was not in my arms until four hours after the horrific events of that day. I am a mother, the mother, of a 15-year-old child who has to live with the reality that my baby could have been one of the victims who did not come home from school that day. I am the mother of a 15-year-old child who mourns with the parents and loved ones of those who are not as lucky as me. I am the mother of a 15-year-old child who has changed forever. I am the mother of a 15-year-old child whose life will never be the same. I am the mother of a 15-year-old child who survived a mass shooting at his school. This is the time that we all have to say, not one more. I was hitting my, I was hitting my side uh, twice, and I got hit in my stomach. So I was kind of like cut all open. Once you get shot, like your skin instantly swells. So I'm thinking that the bullet is just like right there. So we like trying to pull it out. I got a plate in my stomach. I got a plate in my stomach uh, right now that I do feel when weather is down like this or when I feel that, or if it's raining or something like that, like you can still feel the aches. Like, you know, it's like something that's like lifetime that never go away. Like, so yeah, I still feel the aches here and there. My bone and everything right here was like completely shattered. So they had to replace that with the plate. It's a deep cut pain um, when you lose a child due to homicide, murder, gun violence. Um, because you never expected that. Um, you know, one day you talk to your son, the next day they said he's been murdered. Um, and a part of you is snatched out. You lost a piece of your insides. So um, when, I, when, I, when I got that news when my son was found that year, um, Thanksgiving Eve, you know, I was, it destroyed my life. It almost killed me. I wanted to ball up and die. Basically, I did. Um, because, you know, you go like a mother, mother have, having children and birth and pains. I can't describe them pains today. You know, I just know they hurt real bad. So then when you lose your child in that manner, it's like it hurts so bad. It's like my heart cried tears. I can't describe it. I just wanted to ball up and die. I felt violated in the worst way. I thought I heard Black Lives Matter from that corner over there, but I'm not sure.
270 to 310 million people in the U.S. have a gun. Every day, 93 people die from gun violence in America. In this country, people are 25 times more likely to be shot and killed than people in developing countries. Even so, there are pro-gun supporters. How many incidents is it going to take for us to take action? You could be affected by misuse of firearms at any time. Violence should entice together. Us together. Guitar Man at Superhero at Large here, and I'd just like to take a moment to talk about uh, uh, gun, the problems with gun violence here in America. Um, I have a, a new argument for anybody out there. I uh, got into a debate with my niece, who suddenly became a gun nut. I think her boyfriend's a gun nut, so now she's a gun nut. And uh, I explained to her, you know, we're not gun people because, you know, my mother, her grandmother, got shot when she was seven years old by accident by her sister. At any rate, her argument was, oh, it's the bullying. I says, well, blame it on the kids. And then she came back with, well, it's a mental health issue, and I'm not crazy, so I can own all the guns I want. Well, I got to thinking about that. And I think your brother, I think, Tom, your brother would, would agree with me on this, but the American Medical Association has determined that one cannot diagnose their own psychoses or lack thereof. So if I was uh, going to Social Security to get a, a check because I feel I'm crazy, I can't just walk in and say I'm crazy, give me a check. They have to examine me. A doctor has to see me. So my point is, I can't say I'm crazy. How can you say you're not crazy without a dry diagnosis? So. If you want to own a gun, I'm not talking about just background checks. I'm talking full psychological evaluation. And I didn't say it. It's all the gun nuts are saying it's a mental health issue. Well, if it's a mental health issue, then let's make it a mental health issue. Let's involve the doctors. Uh, think about that. That's a good argument. It, it'll never happen, but it's a really good argument when coming somebody tells you it's a mental health issue. At any rate, I got a little song here. And it goes like this. In America, we love our AR-15s. To kill a squirrel's gonna take about a hundred shots. In America, we love our AR-15s. Get one, I'd sell everything that I got. And I don't give a damn what the snowflakes say. I got my faith in the Second Amendment and the NRA. In America, we love our AR 15s. Kill a squirrel takes a hundred shots To get one I'd sell everything I got I need more guns to keep from getting shot <laughs> Oh, you know that was fun wasn't it? Yep. I got one more little ditty Now this is the least I could do This song is about um this is pretty much uh, how uh, uh, Republican Congress responds to um, the thought of the slightest gun control. And it goes like this. This here's the shortest song about gun control in the world. Thoughts and prayers. Now get over it.
Are you soon to be an unemployed Homeland Security agent? A contractor just back from Afghanistan or some secret mission and unable to find a job? Do you enjoy children and the feeling of holding an automatic assault rifle in your hands? Well, we've got a job for you. Through a special program co-sponsored by the Republican-controlled House of Representatives and Republican state legislatures everywhere. In conjunction with the NRA, we are seeking a few thousand good men and women to become members of our new Safety in Our Schools Security Force. Yes, friends, if you want to keep your weapon loaded, but want time to play with the kids, experience the thrill of walking the halls of your local elementary school, seeking out potential killers, or if you want to be able to share a cig with a cool 11th grader while doing target practice outside the gymnasium, then this is a job for you. If you want this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, just go online and contact Wayne LaPierre of the NRA for your free employment application and receive a courtesy monogram box of shells just for applying. Or call 1-800-KILL-THEM-ALL. Operators are standing by. This commercial is paid for by money stolen by the Coalition of Men for Global Warming. Biff Barf here with the sports, getting serious for a change. We've had the privilege and the duty of covering the Chief Wahoo opening day demonstrations since we came on the air 24 years ago. In honor of the forced retirement of Chief Wahoo by Major League Baseball in the Dolans, we present opening day 2018, and the lonesome death of Chief Wahoo.
So may all your news be good news. And every child get a new pair of shoes. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you. I make you laugh. I'm here to fucking amuse you. What do you mean funny? Funny how? I'm Hello, a... Liberal Bias TV. Uh, I'm just calling to make a suggestion. Why don't you have uh, like a, de a debate between opposing viewpoints on your set of having uh, just a one-sided conversation all the time? Because then you might, you might be more like a legitimate news show instead of just plain straight-up propaganda. Go to Europe as a minority American bad for really speaking one of you. You're in the minority, you know that, right? I have never seen such insufferable trash in my life. 